and we are back for our Facebook Live series. And I'm really excited today because uh, joining us is not only this amazing woman, but also a friend of mine. Dawn Holden Woods is the CEO of Children. She's also the Managing Director for Children and Family Social Services at PHMC. And we're gonna hear from her today about how they're innovating and what they're doing. Hi, Hi Michelle, Dawn. thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, Dawn doesn't live too far from me and I walk by her street sometime and, and think of her. So I'm really <laughs> excited to be actually talking together today. Um, so let's start by telling us about Turning Points and what you do there. Turning Points for Children, we are um, one of the city's largest social service organizations, but I really like to think of ourselves as frontline heroes for kids. So we're we're first responders, you know, a child is abused or neglected and, you know, the city department of human services reaches out to us to find alternative homes and, and safe environments for kids. And, and so all of our work is really rooted in a thriving community for all and finding creative ways to support children and families. I love that. I found Turning Points for Children um, probably like seven or eight years ago. I was looking for somewhere to do my United Way donation and I Googled um, agencies that help prevent child abuse and Turning Points for Children came up and I started doing my United Way donation there and reached out and found um, ways to engage with the organization that I will talk about later because I think everybody should uh, look into engaging with Turning Points for Children. They're amazing. And then kind of through that, uh, Don and I met and and started talking and now you've moved into this position as CEO which is really incredible uh, so you guys do really really important work and I think you you really serve underserved and vulnerable populations which I think is is so critically important um, particularly in, in our city and I'm wondering if you can tell us about how the current COVID-19 crisis is maybe impacting those populations even more than some others Absolutely. So, you know, one of the ways I like to really think about the impact of COVID-19 is when I was a child, I used to get an allowance, right? And so let's say I got $5 and I wanted to go to the store to get, you know, five candy bars. But when I get there, they would add in tax. And then I wouldn't realize going in that my $5 wouldn't actually purchase what I wanted anymore because you know you need $5.23 to technically purchase it. And I feel like that's the impact that COVID-19 is actually having on families. It's, a, it's an additional tax on the city's most vulnerable um, population. Uh, think about it, if, if you barely had enough money to get by before the pandemic hit, now you're like your dollar doesn't even go as far as it used to and that wasn't enough before you know we have most of our families one in four families in the city is is getting public you know free lunch free food and so you look at schools closing and you know kudos to the district for finding ways in partnership with the city to still offer some of these supports but we have coaches coming to our food bank from Frankfurt High School to still get food to their players. So, you know, the impact that this is having on families, like I, I don't think we'll fully know what that impact is for several years, technically. Um, so it's it's really scary. We have a number of, you know, folks who are afraid of being homeless because, you know, they were barely able to make ends meet and now they're unemployed. So it, we've had young people who've been in our office who are, you know, experiencing some serious mental health challenges because, you know, they were already feeling pretty fragile. And I know I definitely have days where, you know, I feel sad. I'm, you know, concerned about my own well-being and I have everything that I need. I have food, I have shelter, I have all the money that I need. But some days like living in this environment is still hard. So think about if you don't have everything you need and and you're still trying to make it through. It's it's really tough on families. I'm really proud that we're still open and delivering services. You know, we have workers at the office every day who are meeting with families, delivering food, completing virtual health and telehealth appointments with families. I mean, we're all doing all that we can to try to, you know, make sure people are supported, but there are days where we're at the office waiting for food delivery, but an employee of the agency supplying the food thinks they have someone who's tested positive. And so that order is wow. delayed. 
So it's, it's, it's really, really scary. And, I, and all of us worry a lot about the families we serve and the impact that this is having and you know whether or not we'll we'll ever find out like what we don't know like what's really happening behind closed doors yeah yeah no it, it's it's um it's interesting i remember in the beginning of this some people were saying oh this is the great equalizer and and it's not the equalizer right it, it's showing us all of of the problems that were already there but really highlighting them and, and helping us realize how much harder hit um, people in different pockets are, you know, and and it's so important to remember that. And you guys are are still doing incredible work. You mentioned the, you have people in the office. You mentioned the food pantries. What can everybody watching do to help those communities that are harder hit? Uh, whether it's you know through turning points for children or other places, what can we do to to help some of those populations? So I mean, I think one of the things that we need is is always money. I mean, I'm sure when you have folks who run nonprofits like the impact of the pandemic on our organizations is real as well. Um, so if folks have extra income and can donate, it, it would be greatly appreciated. Last Friday, and Michelle, you've been several years to our gala. It would have been our largest fundraising event, except we weren't able to host that event in person. And we're hoping to reschedule it in the fall, but you know, we definitely need resources. We need more money to, to purchase more food for families than generally we would plan to do. So I would definitely say donating. The other thing would be we can could use support around masks. So we have thousands of children in our care who may or may not actually have masks as well as resource parents. So if there are folks out there who are interested in making a few thousand reusable masks, we could definitely use those. Oh, that's great to know. Thank you. Um, so Don mentioned that their Kids at Heart Gala is phenomenal. Uh, I'll tell viewers that um, the silent auction is second to none when it's in person. I've spent way too much money there and come home thinking, what in the world did I just do? But when you donate to Turning Points for Children, your money is going directly to the kids that need it. And I think that's so important. How can folks donate? Through your website? Absolutely. So the easiest way right now would be to just head to our website, um, www.turningpointsforchildren.org. There's definitely a donate button there. Obviously, we, we welcome checks. Our main office is open, so you could mail a check to Turning Points for Children at 415 South 15th Street, Philadelphia, PA 19146. Awesome, thanks. And for mask makers, we have a lot of sewers out there. Um, that's another good way to get engaged. So those are, those are two really good ways. Um, you talked about, and I think we're all feeling it, kind of this roller coaster of emotions for us too, right? And, and staying home and, and you have a team that you're leading. How are you staying inspired and you know trying to stay creative with the way you approach your business amidst all of this? Well, it has been really easy to remain inspired just because there's so much good work happening every day. I mean, I, I see emails of you know all the work that folks are doing that's unprompted. You know, no one's supervisor is asking them to go above and beyond. It's just like the human spirit emerges. And so that has been something for me that's, you know, been inspiring, knowing that some of our team members have parents who've been impacted by COVID, yet they're still showing up to the food pantry to pack bags. And we have other team members in our KUAs who've had their parents and family members impacted, and they're still out in the field doing things for families. So that has really moved my spirit. Um, the other thing that I've enjoyed is I've also been listening and um, reading a number of stories of just about like medical professionals you know, Turning Points is a part of PHMC and their health centers are still open. And so seeing the work that folks are doing with um, homeless individuals in the city who are coming in for support has been inspiring. Listening to stories of nurses in New York who, you know, sometimes are using duct tape and being as creative as they could be. Like, I mean, sometimes it makes me a little frustrated that um, we haven't done more as a country to prepare, but it's still inspiring to know that like, people want to help others. People are willing to do everything they can to save save a life of a stranger because we all recognize that we're connected. And so I, I've really appreciated seeing that. And that's something that has kept me inspired. 
I love that. I know it, it, I, I'm on this, this crazy emotional roller coaster. Like I watched a, a video this morning of people with their dogs on Instagram and I'm like crying, right? Because you're like, oh, everybody's so happy and kind to one another right now. It's ridiculous, but it is. It's so lovely to see the stories that come out and how people are getting creative to stay connected to their loved ones and, and to help others. It's, it's really, really lovely. Um, so uh, turning points for children is over 180 years old, which is insane. How does an organization with that much history keep innovating? Talk about some of the things that you do that are really interesting and innovative. Well, one of the things that I always think about that my predecessor used to preach was that we want to be the best, like the work that we do, serving families, wanting to help people change their life. Like that's something that like you want to be your best for others. And so I think our internal spirit of wanting to be the best helps us to continually think about how can we, you know, change and adapt our services to the times. You know, I've been fortunate enough to be invited to some forums where people are talking about artificial intelligence and like how that can be used in our sector. And I mean, a lot of times we don't think about that, but yeah. it's incredible the types of things that are that are out there. I mean, we're looking at the potential and the possibility of using like virtual reality headsets to think about training new social workers as just like another tool in the toolkit to help people be exposed to the work. Um, and so I, I think we're an organization that's generally curious. I think people ask good questions. The pandemic has definitely, I think, encouraged people to adapt quickly. Um, and so just to see the, the amount of things that we've been able to create YouTube channels for to keep folks connected and the fact that we thought we couldn't you know, certify resource parents virtually, but between some in-person interactions as well as Zoom and all these other online platforms that we have, like we've been able to get the work done. And I and I pray that we're able to remain connected even when we're able to be in person, that these tools remain in place so that if someone feels vulnerable in the middle of the night, they can, you know, call or contact the worker and we can jump online and really use some of these supports to remain connected even when we can be in person. That's awesome. You guys are just finding a way to get it done, right? Like by any means necessary, getting it done, but then also building this stuff into your everyday. Like you said, and that's what makes you such a great organization that can withstand because you do that. Um, you mentioned your predecessor. So when did you take over as CEO? So I became the CEO in 2017, fall of 2017. It became official. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I love this so much. So uh, you are the first CEO at Turning Points for Children who is a woman of color, and there are far too few women of color in CEO roles, too few women in CEO roles, and particularly too few women of color. Um, so I want to know when you were going into this role, um, what were you most excited about besides shattering ceilings? What else What else were you most excited about as you took on this? Because this, this is a huge job. It is a huge job. I mean, I was excited as a woman of color to have the opportunity to show that, you know, I was competent and, and that people like me deserve these opportunities, um, that we bring a unique perspective on the work that we do, the families that we serve. I'm a product of, you know, some of the same families. So, I mean, I think that is something that was really exciting. Um, one of the things that I, that I didn't really think about um, that I've really come to appreciate was how much this meant for all of us. I mean, when I was promoted, there were a number of folks who called and sent letters who worked for Turning Points that said, you know, I've worked for 30 years in, in the field of social work and I've never worked for, you know, a woman of color. And so, you know, people were like, we're rooting for you. Someone sent me an email like, you're Michelle Obama. At which point I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a, you know, a real privilege, but I think it, and because I worked there for so long, I don't think I thought it would mean as much because it's not like I was a new person coming in. I, you know, I've been there for 14, 15 years at that point, but it's still really, that change really meant something for like the entire organization, which I've appreciated. So that, that has really been a, a real gift and it really makes me, um, 
I've always wanted to serve the communities that we serve, but it's really made me want to also do well because I know that there are so many other people who work for the organization that are rooting for me, that also want me to be successful because they see my success as their success. And I appreciate that. Oh man, I have chills. I'm like crying a little. That's pretty incredible. I mean, that's huge, you know? Um, and you are successful. I think you're phenomenal. You're one of the most thoughtful, um, smart, kind, funny people I know. And it, it's, it's so lovely to see you in this role. And it, it does, it means so much. So that's that's so phenomenal. I love that. Um, so what's your biggest hope following COVID? What do, you, what do you hope will come out of all of this? Or maybe it just for you personally, what do you want to happen after all of this? One thing that I'm, you know, really hopeful and one thing I'm looking forward to is really the opportunity to gather. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but I think I took that for granted. And so I hope that we'll be able to come together and really appreciate one another. I mean, I know before I was always thinking about, oh, I'm busy and I'll, I'll drop in something and I'm going to head home. And, and so really wanting to remain connected. Um, that's something that I hope will come out of this. I think the need for community, I think when things are good, you know, it's easy to go about your day and not really feel like you need to check on other people and really, you know, cultivate personal communities. And I think it's been great how much I've, I talked to some of my friends that live in other states um, now. And so really wanting to continue to just like think about others and build that into my daily life. And um, also being grateful, you know, good health, wake up every day. And, and, you know, there are days where I might write in my journal, like, oh, I feel grateful for good health as I start today. But it really hits differently during the pandemic. I mean, when you know people who've been impacted, when when you hear stories of those you love who have friends um, and colleagues who are impacted, I think just like the importance of focusing on our health and making good choices every day and make sure and ensuring that there are equitable resources in all communities to really focus on, on you know, personal health when this pandemic is over because the truth is the folks being hit the hardest and communities of color now, like didn't have the resources they need before they need it before the pandemic hit. And, and so I hope that we can really elevate that conversation coming out of all of this. It's like, what are we going to do differently as a community to make sure that, you know, there's healthcare for all, that there are healthy foods in all communities, that they're easy to access, that they're affordable, you know, those things really matter. They, they really do. And I think we have a responsibility to to try to figure that out. And, you know, it, it's it's an ongoing problem. But you mentioned gratitude. I have this super cheesy sign by my front door that my family makes fun of me for that says, I'm looking at it, it says, start each day with a grateful heart. And I think right, gratitude is incredibly important. It is about just remembering every single day what we have. And I've been saying to folks I've been talking to, we're so lucky, right? I'm I'm so grateful. We're we're healthy right now. I'm, I'm home with the kids who some days I, I wish lived somewhere else, but generally they're lovely. Um, and I'm, I'm mostly grateful for them. I got a bunch of animals here. I got the dog and the cat literally sitting next to me right here who have to be with me all the time. But I mean, just so incredibly grateful for everything that we have. And, um, and that's a huge lesson that I think is coming out of this for, mm -hmm. for all of this. So that's been, been really, really nice. Um, so with everything moving into the fall now, tell us about the gala that's happening in the fall. Is the yes. Kids at Heart gala moving? Yeah. Yeah. So our gala is currently scheduled for September 10th. We're excited at the Franklin Institute. We're still excited about it. We have great honorees. We have Richard Cohen, who is the CEO of Public Health Management Corporation. We have Rakia Reynolds, who is um, the owner of Sky Blue Media. And we also have Mike Inocenzo, the CEO of Pico Energy. And so anyone who's been to our party knows it's a party with a purpose. We work really hard to communicate the good work that we're doing and, and to highlight all of the reasons why we've selected the honorees that we picked for the gala. And then we have a good time. And so we're planning 
to have it in person, even if there are fewer of us there, right? To make sure we're keeping each other safe. And we're also looking into like virtual options, you know? Could this be a virtual party with a purpose? What does that look like? You know, what what will philanthropy look like moving forward? So it'll be a great time, a lot of fun, um, good food, good people, good energy. It's it's phenomenal. It's so much fun. And if you guys go virtual, I will 100% put on a gown and da do a dance party at my house. I have like, <laughs> I I'll do that right now, actually. <laughs> Let's just be honest. But um, it's phenomenal. And I would really encourage anyone watching to check it out and donate now. Don't wait until then, but also check out and see if you can attend, be it in person or virtual. Um, it's just such a really incredibly good cause. Um, so we had a question. Uh, do you feel journaling is important, especially in times like this? I think you mentioned journaling and that as we think about gratitude. Um, is that a practice that you do? It is. I'm not always as consistent with it as I would like to be, but I definitely think journaling and really anything that brings you comfort, I think is important during these times. For me, there are days where I have so many different emotions that are going through my head and heart that journaling is just a way to get them out on paper. And sometimes for me to analyze and really figure out like what, what really is going on, what am I perhaps really excited about or anxious about. So it's something that is important to me. We've also, you know, been hosting some self-care webinars internally for staff um, and some different, and, and we have some coloring books that, that um, adults can use. And so I think finding ways just to um, release some energy and find, find some peace is incredibly important. I love that. I, I just said this morning to my husband, I take joy in, in the tiniest things. I decorated my hallway this week. Who in the world decorates a hallway? But, but, but um, every time I walk down my hallway now, I'm super pumped because it's, it's decorated. <laughs> so I think like finding anything that brings you joy is great, right? Um, and, uh, you know, a, a everything you guys are doing is, is really phenomenal. We have a few minutes left, but I want to I wanna talk about, I want to do a plug for turning points for children and I want to talk about how people can continue supporting um, I mentioned that I found you all when I did my United Way donation so first and foremost it's a you know if you're doing United Way campaigns through your workplaces um, look up turning points for children support them um, money always helps right <laughs> every nonprofit organization needs money. So that's kind of first and foremost. And then something we did for years at, at my workplace at Independence Blue Cross is we were able at the, during the holidays to organize uh, collections. So for years, every holiday season, Turning Points for Children would make sure that every foster child got a pair of pajamas, a book, and a toy, um, which is really special because sometimes these are kids who don't get a lot of presents or maybe ever. Um, so that was a really easy thing and people get really uh, excited to shop. And it is a great time to start online shopping because what else do you have to do? So start your holiday shopping now, start collecting things that you can take to turning points. Um, Don mentioned masks, they need masks. So if you're a sewer and you're pulling masks together, um, get them together and reach out to us through BPHL. We'll help you get them over to them if, if you need that. We're happy to do that. Um, other ways that folks watching can and help support Turning Points for Children through food pantries or anything else, Don? Absolutely. I mean, you know, once we're fully operational and allowed to be close together again, that's what I mean when I say fully operational. It's like we can invite others in. I mean, we definitely look for donations to make kits for foster kids. I mean, it's an, it, it, none of us can imagine what it's like to be removed from your family. And then so you have that impact plus you don't have any of your things you may not even have a toothbrush or pajamas or book so we collect donations year round to compile those kits you know right now another way that folks could get involved is like if you have a special skill that translates well over zoom i mean we're looking for opportunities to just thank our staff who are out here in the field every day so you know, if someone wants to host a virtual cooking class or if there are ways to think about nutrition with simple ingredients that most folks have around their house, if that's something that, you know, you have a skill set for and you'd be willing to donate an hour of your time, we definitely appreciate it. Opportunities to engage teenagers. We have a residential program with 30 teens who are together, um, who are looking for things to do. So, you know, I think just ways to support one another virtually and, and opportunities for folks to leverage their expertise um, virtually would be something that we'd welcome right now for sure. 
Those are really great ideas. I think so many people are looking for ways to help. So folks, you heard it. If you have time to give, if you have talent that could be leveraged, um, and as always, if you have funds, uh, please reach out to us. We'll make sure you get connected to Dawn and the Turning Points for Children. Um, I also want to say hi to some of your staff who I love. You you have this amazing staff. So um, Eartha, I utterly adore. I know she's watching. Hi, Eartha and Monica and your whole team. They're just so lovely. And I mean, you know, clearly to do this kind of work, you have to be the kindest people on earth. And I, I want to mention a comment that came out that I really love, which says, Don, thank you for being the voice of a voiceless group of disenfranchised, mostly uh, vastly minority people. And it, it really is incredible incredible what you guys are doing and every time I see you you're smiling and you just have this lovely spirit and energy and you bring that to your team at Turning Points for Children and um, to everything you do and we just really appreciate it and I, I think that the Michelle Obama comparison is is not too far off there buddy I think you're, <laughs> I think you're nailing it. <laughs> Um, anything else you want to share before we sign off? We're just wrapping up, but I want to give you a chance to say anything we haven't hit on. No, I just we're just grateful for this opportunity, and we hope that folks will, you know, take a moment to head over to our website just to learn more about, you know, our work and you know the needs that exist here in the city for children and families and and we hope that people who have a passion for that will you know lock hands with us and figure out how to support us i mean there may be ideas that we don't even know about yet because we just haven't connected with people who have you know different ideas about how we can continue to cultivate community and support everyone that's here in philadelphia so this was exciting thanks for having me on Michelle, you know, I can't wait to catch up with you. It's a shame we had to catch up via um, via this fireside chat. I know. We definitely have to do a better job of staying in touch. We're going to get on Zoom and like have lunch <laughs> together and maybe do a fashion show or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> somebody said becoming Don Holden Woods. And I love it. I am there for it. I am so <laughs> here for it. Yes. <laughs> you guys, thank you all for watching so much. And Don, thank you so much for being with us. You guys heard it. If you're looking for something to do, look no further. Go on to the Turning Points for Children website and you heard all of the ways that you can support. If you need help connecting, get in touch and we'll make sure you get to them. And uh, otherwise, we hope everybody has a great Friday. It is Friday. I know the days are all blending together. Time is like irrelevant now. But uh, have a great Friday and a great weekend. And thanks again, Don. And we'll, we'll catch up soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. This was great.